Let me continue. Uh, we were discussing why do we have convolution layers and we were mainly uh, over the concepts, mathematical concepts, how uh, functions. And actually we didn't um, ask the questions why yet we are going to. You didn't I? I'm, I'm recording. I'm recording. Your friend is asking if you're recording. Thank you very much. Always do this, please. I am recording. Anyways, um, we didn't ask the questions why. Uh, now it's time to ask some why-like questions. Before that, let me introduce another uh, concept from our perceptive mechanism in mammal brains. We have a concept of receptive field. Receptive field in biology is uh, in a sensory space. I mean, you have a sensor, and that space, that sensor is capable of getting information from a space, from a spatial dimension, in our case. So you have a sensor, like your eye, and it has some outputs, creating signals. It's connected to some neurons, okay? Then those neurons are connected to other neurons. Those neurons are connected to other neurons. Familiar, right? Like the convolutional neural network. At some point, those connections actually not before uh, talking about uh, what happens to them at some point, at the very first connection, I mean, the, the eye, there is the, uh, the first output of the or sensor eye is connected to some neurons. And there are regional connections, just like the convolutional layers. Those first neurons only are capable of getting information from some parts of the output of the uh, eye, just like a convolutional filter capable of getting information from a small region, three by three. At that neuron, the activations will be created by using only the information from that regional part, right? From those pixels. That's called the receptive field. What part of the input, what field of the input you receive information from? That's called the receptive field. And actually in biology, we have some receptive fields and when neuroscientists study this, it is important how strong the receptive field of a neuron is. Because if the receptive field is larger, imagine if you, if you have those connections, you have the eye connected to some neurons, those neurons are interconnected to some other neurons, and you get deeper in your brain, the neurons will have a higher, larger receptive field, right? So damaging those neurons will give more damage to your sensory capabilities compared to damaging a neuron which is closer to the, that would be regional, right? So that receptive field is very important. Actually, that the very same concept can be also mentioned about the convolutional layers. So it is, yes, just touching, this is the receptive field, like that part. So, so it is the same for convolutional layers. Imagine we have an input, this is the first activation. If it's a three by three filter in the first convolutional layer, this first activation was created using this information, right? And we have another layer, again, three by three, no padding this time. Since there's no padding, the activations are getting smaller and smaller. In this very uh, simple neural network architecture with two layers, I have a single activation here, which is getting information from all the input, right? Almost all the input, because yes, because it is getting from all of it. Not all of it, not almost all, all of it. This this node is getting from these activations, and each activation is getting from all of the input. So the receptive field of this neuron will be the entire input. However, the receptive field of this neuron will be this input. This receptive field is important because imagine you want to calculate edges. Let's get back to that idea. You want to calculate edges. Edges can be calculated in multi-scales. This is called the multi-scale approach in computer vision, which is something you don't have to know. For example, when you look at an image, imagine this is a 3D world. It's difficult to imagine it that way, but you're looking at the screen. And imagine it was the photograph of the screen, okay? Some parts of the image will create edges, right? 
the thin edges like this guy, because that's an image, maybe I should uh, put it that way so the zoom people will uh, see it as well. This is an image. This is an edge, I'm sorry. This is an edge. As you can see, there's an edge here. However, if you looked from very far away, you moved 100 meters far, and you were still able to see the screen image. In that case, uh, if you have not extraordinary seeing capability, you won't be able to uh, make up the letters. You won't be able to read them. The letters will be like lines. They will look like lines and they will create edges as well. So different scales of edges. Maybe you want to calculate these edges. Maybe you want to calculate the edges this line creates with this uh, page. Then you should look from far behind. This will require different sized convolutional neural, uh, neural filters, guys. And actually, this is related to the receptive field. To calculate this thin edge, you will need a very thin, small receptive field. Or to calculate the edge created by lines, imagine you are trying to detect the lines of text in an image, you're doing. then the type of filter you need should be larger and should have a larger receptive field. Okay? So that's the idea. The activations relation to the inputs and the previous activations. That's called the receptive field. Why do, did we learn this? We are going to make use of this fact a lot because I told you CNNs are handcraftedly designed. I mean, designed. I mean, in, um, there are advanced concepts in deep learning, such as neural architecture search, which is, uh, I mean, advanced and further concepts. You, you will delve into those kind of concepts if you will after an introductory level deep learning course like this. But in the very beginnery level of deep learning, you design your network. And the network is not necessarily an image processing network. AlexNet is. However, you can be working on earthquake data. And for example, earthquake accelerograms. It's a type of signals like sound signal you calculate. What you do is you calculate a so-called spectrogram from that data. Spectrogram is frequency versus time graphs. So how does the strength of each frequency signal changes? I mean, if you're not into engineering, it, it doesn't sound anything to you, but I'm trying to give an example. So that's the signal you are going to work on. So when you're designing a convolutional neural network for that, what you should keep in mind is, okay, I'm going to convolve dimensions of time and frequency. So what kind of a filter I should be designing? If it's three by three, I'll be convolving three adjacent dimensions in the frequency. Will it make sense? What I'm trying to find, kind of. This is the handcrafted design you do. So understanding the receptive field in a convolutional neural network is very important when you're designing your convolutional neural network. We're going to get there. I mean, it's, it is difficult to tell because you will be working, designing, testing things in your projects and etc. if you're going to be using convolutional neural networks. And frankly, if you're going to do NLP, Maybe working on only textual data, and you won't be able to, you won't be using convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks is for signals which has spatial nature, which was collected with a sensor that can extract data from the space, the real space. Or it could be not in real space, because for example, the frequency domain of an earthquake signal is also spatial. However, that's not the space that we live in, it's a mathematical theoretical space. Anyways, okay. So, another layer. Uh, actually, there are, there are very different types of layers in convolutional neural networks, and I'm going to cover very different types of layers in the next week. However, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, sufficient types of layers this week so that today we'll be able to go over the famous LXNet entirely and understand how it works. So I'm going to provide only the layers which exist in LXNet, only in the inference AlexNet. There's training AlexNet and inference AlexNet we'll be talking about in the uh, following weeks. So when we are testing, there's the simple version of AlexNet. In that AlexNet, we have some sort of layers. We are going to see them today. Next one is the pooling layer. Pooling layer is exactly what your friend asked in the previous hour. We can, at some point, downsample the actuations. Why do we do this? There's a reason for that, and we are going to understand it in AlexNet. But First, the mechanism and the mathematics, okay? Convolutional layers and convolutional neural networks systematically apply learned filters to input signals or images or sound values, whatever, 
in order to create feature maps and summarize the presence of those features in the input. And those features evolve hierarchically as we get deeper and deeper in the convolutional layers. Convolutional layers prove very effective and stacking convolutional layers in deep models allows layers close to the input to learn low level features and deeper to learn higher level features, that hierarchical uh, feature extraction mechanism. Good, however, a limitation of feature map output of convolutional layer is that they record the precise position of features in the point. Good, if you're trying to extract features, convolutional layers is good. This means that small movements in the position of the feature to the input will result in different feature maps. I mean, if you're trying to localize a feature, that's good. But maybe we are trying to understand something general from the image. Or maybe we want our feature to be calculated not from three by three pixels, but from a larger image. Because maybe we have a very large, uh, maybe our resolution is very high. If you have very high resolution, a small convolutional filter is like looking at a high resolution image at a very close distance. What you will be seeing is very similar pixels. You won't be able to make it, uh, make the uh, meaning of the image. So maybe if you extracted features first, small features, then just take a step back, extracted features, take another step back, extracted features. That would mean something, right? Actually, that taking a step back is downsampling the actuations uh, when it comes to the mathematics of it. And pooling layers are used for downsampling those actuations. Okay, so pooling layers. You have this actuation. When you pull it to half, you have the half of the actuation. So for example, these are the feature values for a filter. I've used a gray level false color, which means if the actuations are higher, it is more white. If the actuation values are lower, it is darker. It is, I have these activations. It, it, it is not necessarily the first layer, the pooling layer. It could be activations as well. I downsample it with pooling and I obtain this. So it will be like looking at those as activations, taking them one step back. That's the idea. This is where a low resolution version of an input signal or an activation is created that still contains the larger important structural elements. If you want to see the big picture, then you should apply the pooling layer. Because for example, if you want to build a classification network like AlexNet, which classifies the entire image into a category, at some point in your network, your receptive field should be as large as the image itself. You'll be checking all the image. That makes sense, right? Okay, so pooling layers. There are different types of pooling layers where this downsampling mechanism is uh, operationalized with different mathematical operators. Uh, all have different usages. Uh, I'm going to be talking about them. Uh, actually, in the end, uh, you will understand that they don't make much of a difference because you're just averaging something to get a downsampled image. The, one is the first one is the average pooling, which I'm going to be covering in a couple of slides. When you're downsampling, because when you're downsampling to half, what you, you're doing is if you have two by two uh, region, you are getting a signal pixel, a single pixel out of it. Four by four becomes one because you're halving in both dimensions. In that case, what happens is you're taking the average of those four pixels and putting it there. Or maximum, maybe you're getting the maximum value of the, uh, the four, which makes sense, guys, not averaging maximum because naturally you would think that downsampling is better when you do it with averaging and in signal processing theory, it is that way. However, these are not necessarily the signals itself. They are the features. They are the activations. For example, from a region, you had an activation. Maybe getting the strongest activation, strongest stimuli, stimuli listening to the most powerful neuron at that area, maybe it's a better idea to decide on something. Maybe that feature uh, at that layer, that activation was trying to decide if there was a, I don't know, if there was a window in that part, because maybe what you're trying to do in that convolutional uh, architecture is, you're trying to understand if there's a house in the image. And if there's a window in one of the actuations, getting the maximum of them makes more sense, because if you take the average, 
that strong information of having a window at an actuation point will be lost. I don't want to lose it. Maybe for a classification problem, pooling by choosing the maximum is a better idea, which is the case in LXNet, which we are going to cover today. Or minimum pooling, not used much, but in some certain types of layers and etc. Okay, so there are different types of pooling mechanisms and they all make sense. Okay, so what is max pooling? Max pooling is very simple, guys. Max pooling, well, the, the rule of uh, the output size is the same as the convolution of filters. So you have a filter of two by two. What you do is you have a two by two, you have a stride of two, which means you get this one first, then you jump two pixels, you get to this one first. Okay, but the center is not a pixel now, the center is the is junction point because this is two by two. And I choose the maximum of it. Maximum six, maximum eight, maximum three, maximum four, six, eight, three, four. Maximum pooling makes a lot of sense when it comes to actuations. And actually uh, getting the strongest, uh, stimul stim uh, strongest stimuli in that network is meaningful. So you are trying those are feature detectors. That neuron is screaming to you. I found something valuable. And if you take the average, you will lose its voice in the crowd. Okay, now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to be doing some sort of live code. This is not live code. It will be a live analysis. I'm not going to be writing codes at this point. However, starting with next week, you will start your lab labs. And the labs will be on Python. And the demonstration that I'm going to be doing today will be in MATLAB, but not in MATLAB code. MATLAB has very nice interfaces to visualize these deep neural networks. And at this introductory level, those interfaces are very, very beneficial for you guys, for, for the level of you. And after we do this, please go and watch this YouTube video. It is a famous YouTube video, guys. It is called the Deep Visualization Toolbox. What this guy, this guy is Yosinski, Josef Yosinski. After AlexNet was created, it was a black box, which was working fantastic. We didn't know why it worked properly. We had ideas, hierarchical features and etc. They made a toolbox to visualize every neural. And it's a fantastic video. They, they have an interface. These are the layers of the AlexNet and you can choose the layers, then it will immediately show the activations of that layer, which are obtained from this live video. As he speaks in real time, we have the activations here. And you see that at the very first layer, the edges of the guy is found. And when you get deeper and deeper, the network starts to find eyes, face, shoulders, or the books just right behind the guy. So, it is a visualization and a demonstration of how AlexNet creates the necessary features it needs to create for doing the classification task it needs to do. After this live code, go and watch this video. It is the visualization toolbox by Jason Zosky, not Josef, Jason Zosky. Okay, good. Now let's get to the live code. Guys, what is AlexNet? AlexNet is a very simple convolutional neural network, guys. Actually, convolutional neural networks can be shown in a block architecture like this. I'm going to go over the block architecture first. Sorry. The first thing is the input layer, which is 28, uh, 228 by 228 by 3. Um, okay. The next, I have a convolutional layer, which means the image is fed directly to the convolutional layer. We've calculated this in the previous hour. It was very simple, 11 by 11. Uh, spatial dimension filters and 96 of them and the depth being 3 which should be equal to the depth of the image okay when we calculate this actually what we have is an actuation of 55 by 55 by 96 okay so we have, uh, because we have 96 filters which means the actuations at this actuation layer will be 96 then the next thing is the actuation relu. Usually in a um, traditional uh, perceptron uh, depiction, remember, I've put the weight uh, sum, uh, summation 
and the activation together, right? And usually it is the case because if we don't have the activation layer, I told you, we don't have a nonlinear activation function, which means we, we, we do not create necessary surfaces in our teacher space, decision space. We need the activation function. That's why actually they are combined. And usually these two are called um, convolutional block, just like a perceptron has a nonlinear function. So these two are uh, never separated, guys. So it is like the uh, ANN version of this convolutional neural network. The weight layer and the red layer. This layer ha has parameters to learn, the weights to be learned. That's why if you check it, the parameters to be learned is this. You have these number of layers to be learned. And in ReLU, you have no parameters because this ReLU is like an activation function. You give it a value for each activation value, for each one of these 55 by 55 by 96 values. It separately calculates if it is negative or not. If it is negative, just changes the value with zero. If it is positive, it leaves the value as it is, okay? The next layer, the next layer is a normalization layer, a batch normalization layer. Guys, we're going to talk about this. Batch normalization was a technique used in AlexNet to make the training of AlexNet easier. Nowadays, we don't use it. We have different techniques to make training better. Uh, we are going to talk about this uh, when we talk about uh, how deep neural networks are trained or how they are babysit. In the following weeks, we are going to cover uh, babysitting neural networks, hyperparameter search in neural networks. How do we do our experiments? After you do your first lap, you'll be ready for that. So I'm going to skip this layer for now. Imagine that it doesn't do anything significant because it does not. I mean, in terms of creating features, this does not have any meaning. The meaning of it is it shapes the actuation distribution such that the training will easily continue. Okay, so we have some actuations at this point. They have some values. It shapes the distribution of those values so that the training will properly go. That's all you need to know right now, okay? Now guys, I have a pulling layer, which is, Full size three by three, stride two by two. It's a bit strange, guys. It is three by three, but the jumps are two by two, which means every pulling filter will overlap some part of the previous guy. So it is like it is taking the maximum of it. Sorry, it's taking the maximum of it, but while it's taking the maximum of it, it is taking some overlapped regions so that it doesn't miss any comparison or it misses less comparison is comparing the strengths of the neurons, maybe. So if you just check it, so if you had it, so cross-channel normalization, the same value, so it, the, the activation values do not change. So what we have is a 20 by 27. Why 20 by 27? Remember the output formula for convolutional networks? The same formula applies for pooling networks as well. I'm going to show it to you. So guys, the activations are 55 by 52. So pooling layer size is 55 minus three because this is the size of three by three. No padding, two times zero. The padding is indicated in four values. Spatial dimensions too. So it is like up, down, right, left kind of, okay? So it is, instead of two times zero, I should have said zero plus zero maybe in that dimension, okay? Over, Stride plus one. So this makes 52 over two, 26 plus one, 27. Okay. And it is done for each depth separately. That's why the result of the pooling layer depth is the same as the, uh, the previous layer's depth. The pooling is applied to each depth separately. Okay. So what I did now, up now, what, what have I done? What I did was, I checked the image. I had these large filters, 11 by 11, 96 of them, from 11 by 11 regions, which means receptive fields being 11 by 11. So think of a 227 image, 227 by 227 image. I have regions of 11 by 11, 11 by 11, 
I'm extracting information from all of them. I have a stride of four here. So it is like I'm moving the 11 by 11 filters in an overlapping manner, like half of it overlapping. It is like I'm checking this part of the image, extracting a feature. And I'm extracting 96 different types of features in an overlapping manner from the entire image. These are, when you watch the video of Yosinski guy, you are going to realize that his first layer features are edges, horizontal edges, vertical edges, blobs, red blobs, blue blobs, red green contrast. Red green contrast means the difference of red and green colors uh, for that region. This doesn't make any sense to you, but it is like the stimuli that the cat receives in that experiment, in the neuroscience experiment we have seen. That's the first layer of your visual cortex. We're calculating those features. Then we get the positive ones, we kill the negative ones with ReLU. So if it is negative, I don't want that value. I, I'm not gonna listen to it. It's not strong enough, I say. So it is like a threshold in your brain. Some part of the electrical signals do not pass because they are weak or negative, whatever. Then I do max pooling. When I do max pooling, I am actually choosing, this is max pooling, the strongest one. So I don't care where it exactly came from. In that receptive field, if I had a very strong element, let me choose it. Let me choose the strongest vertical edge from there. Because that strongest vertical edge coming from somewhere and strongest blob coming from another place, maybe we'll make a complicated figure, shape, which is a higher level feature compared to this, these guys, right? That was what happened. We are going to hierarchically apply it. Uh, AlexNet is a serial network. We'll be applying this, applying this, applying this, until we get to a point where the convolutional layers create very high level features with very large receptive fields, meaning the neurons at that deep convolutional layer is touching almost all the input uh, pixels. That's the idea. Okay, good. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to interrupt me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Good. So what do I have next? I have pooling. I have another convolution layer. I have another ReLU. Forget the normalization again. I have another pool. I do the same operation. What I'm trying to build is convolve me features from the features actuations I've just created. I am hierarchically uh, increasing the obstruction of my features. First the edges, creating edges, more complex figures, uh, features, actuations from the previous ones. I'm going to be doing this, guys. Actually, in more complex architectures, in, just like residual nets, ResNet, we are going to see in the following weeks, we have hundreds of layers doing this. In AlexNet, they could only train uh, such a little network, but that was the first idea. That's why it's very important. I mean, it's, it's useless. You, you, you wouldn't use AlexNet in your uh, applications in, in, the, in the industry or whatever academic study you are doing. But the idea was the first time we were doing this. And why we couldn't do it beforehand, I'm going to be talking about it when we talk about how to train neural networks, convolutional layers. Good. So as you can see, let me get the analysis. So pooling, again, con, relu, non, pool. And the activations got smaller. At this point, I have a representation of the image, which is in spatial dimensions, 13 by 13. Uh, you still see the screen? Zoom people because we had a, something. So you can still see, see the screen, right? Yes, we yeah, can see. Okay. Yeah, so at this point, I have a spatial representation at, uh, as an actuation of 13 by 13, a very low resolution image of 300 something actuations showing the strength of features. So it is like I have 384 activations, each showing a different type of high level feature. Maybe some of them showing faces, some of them showing whatever they need. At different parts of the image with a low resolution. So it is like saying, since I've selected max pooling up to now, at this part of the region, there is a face. 
At this part of the region, there is a car. At this part of the region, there is a chair. If you are trying to understand what category this image is, this image is a kitchen image. This image is a person standing. You need that rough information. Because in the end, you're going to cover, collect all that information and make a decision accordingly. Simple. Again, pulling. Again, after that, Convelu. Convelu, before the uh, Relu, we have a double convolutional block here. Convelu plus Convelu, as you can see. Uh, Convelu pool, Convelu pool, then Convelu, Convelu, Convelu. We have a triple convolutional block. Because at this point, our uh, features got very complicated and we are convolving different features out of different features to create very complex activations such as faces and chairs and etc. Or the parts of the chairs and etc. That's what we do. So guys, at this point, actually my convolutional layers are finished. From now on, you won't be able to see any convolutional layers. We have fully connected layers. Before getting into fully connected layers, the, uh, just uh, what we should understand is an, a final pulling layer, which makes it six by six. So again, at this point, there will be no convolutional layers. Convolutional layers are um, designed to extract high level features because we have many convolutional layers convolved with each other, actuations convolved with each, each other. It is like I have a six by six image. I mean, six by six image is not like an image, it's like a matrix, which represents the entire image. Each pixel having very large receptive fields, touching almost more than half of the image, maybe. I don't know. We should calculate it. And they have features of 256. So think of each 256 feature as a detector. Face detector, chair detector, feet detector, sky detector, sun detector, tree detector, kind of. And the information I have here is, at this part of the image, I'm talking about that six by six matrix. At the first matrix, I have a face, I have a tree. At the second one, I have a slide, that playground slides. At the second one, I have sky, 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 sky. Uh, at the next one, I have grass, grass, another slide. I have a, a face, another face. Well, if I could combine all this information, maybe I could say this is a playground image because that's one of the categories it has. And actually, that's why we have a fully connected layer at this point. Fully connected layer means everything is connected to these number of 4,000 something number of neurons, guys. As you can see, you have um, uh, six by six by 256 actuations here, which makes 9,216. If you just multiply six by six by 256, it is this number, guys. This number of nodes is connected to 4,069 nodes, all of them. That's why we have these number of weights here. So it's a fully connected layer. It is like connecting every region and every detector's value to every node. So that we could make a decision. It will be like if um, information coming from the uh, the first row of pixels from the sky detector is high and if there are people maybe it's an outdoor image it's going to decide and i have really again i have dropout we're going to talk about dropouts don't worry just skip it just like batch normalization for now another fully connected layer and their decision layer to make a decision out of the decisions we made in the previous layer and the final fully connected layer of thousand nodes because this network was trained for thousand categories. At this point, I have a score function for every category. The first category is, is this a tiger image, a score. The second category is, is this a kitchen image, a score, thousand categories. The data set that this network was trained with is called ImageNet. It has like 10 million images which are categorized into designated thousand classes. And it was trained as this, and I have in the end a softmax, 
normalizing them, and I train it the loss function like cross entropy. We talked about this difference of the distributions, and this network is trained such that it provides us values of this kind. So that's the idea of a simple convolutional neural network. I'm going to demonstrate some images and show you how it works. But before that, if you have any theoretical questions about the network architecture, please ask. How many of you, uh, I'm asking Zoom and Classroom separately, so I'd like to learn. How many of you uh, have seen a convolutional neural network architecture for the first time in their lives? In the classroom? Almost everybody. Is it the same in the Zoom? I guess so. Yes, if you could raise hands like Uzer, that would be nice, guys. Okay, okay then. Okay, so it, it is really an introductory level for us now. Okay, in the classroom, it's, it makes sense. It is almost everybody in the classroom. That's why they come. Okay, but for uh, many of us, it is not. Not many of us, for five of us. Okay, anyways. Anyway, so that was, uh, that was very valuable for that matter. Any questions? We're going to see a lot of architectures, guys. This will be the first and very simple because it's a linear architecture. This is a linear computational graph. The computational graph will make branches, calculations, some part will encode things. Please. Sorry? You are going to build, your, in your projects, uh, your friends are saying, are we going to build our own architecture? Well, um, it's a bit too late to build our own convolutional neural network architecture. Uh, the architectural designs regarding convolutional neural networks have evolved in the recent years. In your thesis, maybe you can, but for a uh, project of an introductory level deep learning course, it is best that you get to know architectures in the literature and maybe study them and work on them. Okay, it's the best because we have a literature on them. It will be like inventing uh, America again. So we, we, don't, we, don't, we wouldn't want to do that. As you can see, it is a handcrafted design. Most of the well-known architectural designs are well handcrafted guys nowadays, which is bad because if you think about it, we have used handcrafted pattern recognition techniques in the 2000s and they are dead now. Uh, we are using these networks to obtain database calculated features. However, we go further level higher, but the architectures are handcrafted then. Doesn't it make sense that it could be the next step? It is the next step. People are working on neural architecture search. And given that you guys, all of you are unique evolutionary designs. I mean, no brain of two people or two monkey or two mammal is the same. So you have found ways to create your own features in your training, in your life, I'm trying to say. So if we are still the best uh, artificial intelligence machines in the universe, uh, it makes sense, guys. We should find a better way of handcrafted redesigning these architectures. But, so this is an introductory level course and we will be handcrafted with designing these networks. Don't worry about it. What, we, we, what, what we're trying to be doing will be like, we're going to observe different architectures. We, are, we will try to understand why those researchers uh, designed those architectures um, in the first place so that we understand the uh, evolution of uh, deep learning architectures. That will be the idea. Okay, so no questions then. Let's have some I have a question. Oh, please, 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 please. Uh, when, uh, we, we, we use different uh, convolution layer, for, uh, one, four, two, uh, and three. Mm -hmm. And every time, uh, do I need to use uh, the same size for convolutional layer in terms of sizes, uh, okay. three by three, and after that I can use four by four convolution layer, is it okay? Okay, uh, so your, your friend is asking, uh, how, am I, how am I going to uh, decide on the number of convolutional layers and the parameters of the convolutional layers, the size of the convolutional layer, the stride, etc. That's the handcrafted design itself to it. And you're, I, you, you have the right to ask, how am I going to do this? Let's speculate on how Alex Kurzewski did this 
when they were designing AlexNet because today we have some certain rule of thumbs for this, which I'm not going to mention right now. But let's try to speculate how Alex Kirzewski and the group tried to do this. Okay. Most yeah. probably, they've tried different designs. And they have visualized the obtained uh, um, um, actuations. And they have analyzed the accuracies as well. So they have come up with this architecture after so many experimentation. And they have chosen the architecture which was most probably the most successful and accurate. So it was like, at some point, not a very educated handcrafted design, but more like handcrafted design plus analyzing the results of an experiment, just like biology or chemistry. Okay. However, having said that, we have some idea of how to design those uh, feature actuation and receptive field sizes, because in the end, the parameters you're asking for will designate the receptive fields of those neurons, and that's what matters. So you make a simple logic, just like the one I told you. At Alex, then at some point, you have six by six values. It is six by six, meaning the image is a six by six grid, and I'm getting detector information from each six by six cell. And I'm trying to make a decision out of it. Maybe a convolutional architecture followed by a fully connected layer is a good design for a image category classification problem. But maybe it is not a good design for a different type of problem, I should think, maybe segmentation. So we have rule of thumbs like that. Okay. So uh, instead of trying to understand it at this level, let's try to understand the given architectures. Mm -hmm. In time, we'll be able to see the big picture more clearly. Okay. okay? Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Guys, uh, the thing I'm going to do in MATLAB, you can easily do it in uh, Python. It's very easy, but uh, I had this code already, so I want to show you the results. I'm not going to show you any code, but in your lab, you're going to be seeing code, so don't worry about it. So what we focus right now is the results. I've specifically chosen some old images, guys. Because when you, try to, when, when you try to understand a machine learning system, the best thing to do is to check the edge scenarios because they will provide you with the mistakes that will uh, give you the nature of the network. So actually AlexNet, when it was first uh, released uh, in 2012, was very successful. I mean, in everyday images, it had very nice results. And never forget that, it was trained by that thousand category in the image set. So what is the thousand category that we have in AlexNet? Let me put it okay. so you have an idea about it. Sorry, I'm going to this. Image net category. You're going to see it in a second, zoom people. Net categories. Image net categories, guys. Can I see image net categories? So the categories are strange, like this, guys. Goldfish, tiger shark, kind of. So it is like, isn't it object detection category, or it's in the end an entire image label? So that's why it's an image called maybe. J, uh, Dipper, Kite, Vulture. If you go, it is. Let's keep these because these will be important. Uh, I'm going to show you how the network runs with these categories. Guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make MATLAB load AlexNet. It's already loaded in the workspace because I was able to show you in the network analyzer for MATLAB. So guys, let's go over how, because this will give you an idea about how uh, it is done in code as well. So it is the AlexNet. I'm loading the AlexNet and I'm going to show you the AlexNet layers. So if I get this step. So these are the AlexNet layers. As you can see, it's the AlexNet itself. When you load the AlexNet in MATLAB, 
it automatically loads the pre-trained LXNet. So the weights of the LXNet, which was trained in 2012, also is acquired. It is not an empty network. Otherwise, I won't be able to get a proper result from the network, right? When I feed an image, I need the score to be properly calculated. And for that score to be properly calculated, I need the network to be already trained, pre-trained. That's why I have the pre-trained network here and I have the net layers. And if you just get into the net, if you're just curious about, sorry, curious about the weights, it's very easy to see in uh, MATLAB. So this is the, fir the first layer is the input layer. The second layer is the uh, weight layer, the convolution layer, remember con one. And if you just get to the weights, of it, so it is some sort of, it doesn't make any sense to people. It is like the chemical uh, values in your axons and dendrites. Uh, you wouldn't understand your chemical values, you wouldn't understand these either, but you can make them, uh, I mean, uh, you can depict them and visualize them just like Yosinski does, and just watch that video. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, I have a folder of files, just images, just some funny images. Let them be surprises because we'll get very funny results. Um, I load them and I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, I read them, I get the input size because I need the input size. I'm going to, because the input size has to be 20 by, I'm getting the input size from the first layer. I'm going to reshape my image to that input size because AlexNet was trained with images of 227 by 227. I cannot change this. If I want to feed an image, I need to reshape that image. If the image aspect ratio is not one, if it is not a square image, if I just reshape it to square, then you'll be squishing the features in the image. That's not a good thing to do. What I will recommend is to get a square window out of that image and feed it there. Because you'll be changing the, because when I squish the image, people will look thin or, I don't know. So that's not a good idea because the, the original features weights were trained by with normal images in the image net, not squished images. Maybe it won't be able to handle it, okay? So I have, I'm just resizing the image to that value. And I'm doing a prediction. Predict function means in MATLAB, simply get the value of the last layer it says. I'm going to get a score. It's calculating, it's taking a bit of time. Because this, this is not a strong computer. As you can see, the score is a thousand valued vector. I'm going to open the score. Value, 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 lower values. Since I have a softmax, this score function is a normalized function. I could think of it as a probability. Let's find the maximum of it, guys. Max, the code does it already, so I do not do it. So, uh, no, the code does not do it. There's the classify function. So, MATLAB is, uh, has these functions. Classify, when you feed the network, it recognizes networks. Uh, this, it says, ah, uh, this is AlexNet. What was the AlexNet's categories? This classify function handles it all. In usually in Python or in real uh, programming environment, not a toy environment like this, you don't have this. What you should do is, you should find the, find max um, scores, score, ah, sorry, score equal to max score. This is how you do it in MATLAB. So you get the index of the uh, value of the maximum value of the score vector. So what you do is, I score, sorry. Sorry, it should be equal equals, sorry. It says 556, okay? Let me check 556, what is 556? 556. Uh, this starts from one, right? Not zero. Does it start from, it starts from zero. MATLAB indices starts from one. So in this case, it is 500, 500, what was it? I have a fish memory, 545. I said 56, 545. Let's see what 545 is. Electric fan, blower. Let's see what the image is. No, let's see. Okay, I'm going to start again. I'm going to see all the images. 
Okay. Do I have the image? No, not yet. It's cut I think. Yes. I have some problems. Oh. Since I'm connecting. Uh, <sighs> it doesn't create the figure. How am I going to do this? I I'm going to find another solution to this, guys. Sorry, I want to go over the images, that's why. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sometimes MATLAB does this. When you make a remote connection, mm, it has some problems with the figures, but uh, we are going to handle it. So I'm not going to show you the figures. Instead, I'm going to show the figures from the folder. We are going to get the results. Okay, so let's get the file name. image. <laughs> Yok yok ya şu e, kırmızıları görüyor musun bu errorları? Daha önce evet. ben yaşadım uzaktan bağlandığında tamam. figür e, yaptığında sorun veriyor. Clear ol dedikten sonra bir daha yaptım. E, sen e, imshow image dedin ya imshow image yoktu dedin. Yon diyorsun değil mi? Matlab'ın bir tane image diye bir tane şey var. E, Hı, yani tamam. Çocuk resmi var onu gösteriyor. Onu tamam. 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 Ama sağ ol. Tamam. Tamam. Teşekkür ederim. Ama ondan değil yani. E, çok daha başka bir derdi var. Daha önce yaşadığım için biliyorum. Bilmiyorum ne oldu. I'm going to write the name of the file so that we will be checking which file is actually being worked on. And I'm going to get the um, label of the image as well, like this, okay? And I'm not going to draw the figure. So I'm, I'm just skipping the drawing thing so that we just handle it properly. Okay. So guys, here's, here are my images. Okay, let's run. So, the first image is image to PNG, and we found it as electrical fan blower, right? Let's see what image two is. Image two is this. This makes a lot of sense. I'm going to show it to you, don't worry. This makes a lot of sense, guys, because it was not trained with Star Wars characters. And it doesn't look like any kind of mask maybe it has come across while it was trained with, it was trained with, in the data set, it was trained with. So there is a feature that looks like a fan. Most probably, this was a very strong element that overcome other activations. And in the end, it decided that there is a fan like, so it should be a fan kind of decision. This is a very nice example, which is a wrong, I mean, it's a false example, which shows the capabilities of Alex and how it thinks. It depends on the high level features. It had a feature that resembled a fan. It said fan, nothing else. Okay, let's continue. We have many nice uh, uh, results as well. Image three, let's see what image three is guys. Image three, it says band-aid. I think it's a very, very result as well. Good result and this uh, Squid Games was not I mean, it's just very new, guys. It's 2012, there is no such thing. There could be no category. So for a guy who has never seen an, uh, the movie, I mean, if, I mean, so nobody would say that this is a, a band-aid, but it makes sense because it is like closer and similar to the features that would make a band-aid. Good, continue bad examples. Image four, harvester, I love this one. But this is a catastrophe, guys, because there is a category of playground in ImageNet. But somehow, maybe the aspect ratio, maybe the size of the features, AlexNet does these kind of mistakes as well. This is not a harvester, but 
when it says harvester, it's like somebody making a joke about the image because it kind of resembles the harvester. There is the just slide, it's just like the thing of the harvester, whatever. Some low level features may be met, and with some low probability, it gave us this result. Image five, car mirror. Now, this is very nice. Car mirror. This is a futuristic car. In a car mirror, there are some features in a car mirror image, for example. There are some features that makes up that image. It had some similar features, maybe. And in the end, we decided it looks like it, it, there's a car, it's car image, it's the car mirror itself. Another nice uh, wrong example. A dining table. In the end, we have a nice example. We have a kitchen, we have chairs, we have surface. It should be a dining table. Uh, I, I wouldn't say this is a dining table. I would say it's a kitchen image, but in the end, it is good. In all of the examples we, we have seen so far, all the time, it had nice features extracted and correlated with the image, right, guys? Even in the Darth Vader, the fan, because it's a fan, he's most probably breathing now. Yeah. And this one, I love this one. Corkscrew, because it is like <laughs> device. Again, the features, nothing else. And the mortar, uh, that, 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 mortar, mortar means the weapon itself, but mortar means you have uh, in Turkish like harch. You know what mortar is if you're civil engineers most probably know this. So harch, but it looks like harch, mortar, because of the color. It couldn't say something, but maybe, I don't know. It could have said moon, most probably. That's a high level of abstraction we do. So that's how it works, guys. This is how very simple classification networks work. And the convolutional part of the network actually will is and will be called the part out until this part will be called a convolutional encoder. It encoded the abstract features out of that image. We'll be using convolutional encoders in every spatial type of signals, earthquake signals sound signals, images, anything that you can think of collected by a sensor, collection of sensors. So this is convolutional neural networks, guys. Any questions before we finish? Okay, we have questions in chat. Oh, yes. <laughs> 